Yeah, I've had a, a weird uh, ability to end up in a lot of uh, strange situations and crisis situations. And it all started, I guess, when I was um, 17 years old. And I decided that I, was, I wanted to become a secondary school teacher, a high school teacher. By this point, I was a punk rocker. I had a very big uh, purple mohawk, uh, leather jacket, and, uh, and torn up jeans and all this, uh, big boots and all this. And I was a rebel, obviously. And I wanted to create some sort of uh, change in society. Um, and the way that I figured when I was 17 that I wanted to do this was by becoming a, a teacher, secondary school teacher. Because I felt like changing society and somehow promote um, or, or reshaping society and promote more tolerance and more a better understanding of the world and perhaps even better understanding of, uh, of justice and injustice in the world. So this brought me into studying to become a, a secondary school teacher. Uh, the tools that I wanted to use for this obviously was education uh, in a classroom with students and personal communication as a tool to create this change. I studied to become a teacher here in Uppsala, um, history and social studies. But a few years later, when I was, um, uh, well, giving class, obviously, to, to kids, I realized that I wasn't, I was hardly able to use the, the material in, sc in school, the school books, uh, to be able to tell them about, about the world. Because a lot of countries and a lot of, a lot of people in the world weren't actually represented in the school books. And when I turned to, to media, uh, uh, Swedish language media, obviously, because it was for Swedish school, I found basically the same problem, that a lot of countries and people weren't represented in the media coverage at all sometimes. So I decided uh, that I was going to change completely what I did in my life. Uh, even though I identif identified journalism as being still education, I decided to leave my rather safe situation as a teacher, my possible career as a teacher, and my steady income as a teacher. And I started to study a master in journalism. And as soon as I finished, I left for Lebanon to cover the refugee uh, crisis already developing there because of the influx and impact of the Syrian refugees coming to Lebanon. The goal is obviously when I change from being a teacher to an international freelance correspondent was to somehow fill these gaps that I identified and wanted to do something about. And I specifically chose to be only a freelancer. I've never s even tried to apply for a job because of the current media crisis, which means that the number of journalists that are actually being assigned to specialize in a, in a given field or topic or area or question going down like this. So it's up more and more to the freelance journalists to do the job. Uh, since then I've been working in a number of countries covering uh, such questions as democracy, conflict, um, and many other things. But my main focus has been on Syria, because I saw gradually less and less reporting being made from the ground in Syria, where uh, fewer and fewer Western journalists went. And I thought that the Western perspective of what was happening in Syria was extremely important, because in I don't know how many ways uh, the Middle East is connected to Europe, obviously. We share a, a different past and we share a, a future, hopefully. So I thought it was extremely important to, to report from that area. I saw, um, I mean, you all remember, I guess, that uh, if, if Syria is up here right now in reporting, just a few years ago it was going like this. When something really interesting happened, it was up here. And then we had like a big valley with no information at all except for in a few cases. So this was a reaction against that. I wondered what the, si the humanitarian situation was like 
the uh, refugee situation. Uh, inside, I've been able to see, inside Syria, I've been able to see ethnic cleansing. I've been together with um, standing inside an ocean of tens of thousands of refugees. And we've been seeing the Islamic State set fire to a village two kilometers away. Uh, I've been with civilians inside cities when they've been um, uh, hit by, by grenade shellings from the Islamic State and other rebels. Uh, I've seen a lot of death, obviously. I've been forced to, to help to bury headless corpses myself in Syria. And I was also famously arrested by the Syrian regime this February, uh, when I was uh, unfortunately taken on the street and I was imprisoned in a, in a corridor together with 27 fighters from the Islamic State. We were very happy to meet a Swede. Uh, really, actually. And uh, I got this extremely rare glimpse into the, the brutal torture and mistreatment in the, in the regime prison. Really unique experience, obviously. But that is, not the same, that is not something that has actually traumatized me the most. Being a part of all these, uh, these really scary situations, obviously, and being imprisoned. The most traumatizing thing that I saw was this. When, in August last year, the Islamic State, it had just changed its name from ISIS to IS. They attacked the city of uh, Shingal or Sinjar in northern uh, Iraq, on the border to Syria, uh, with a lot of heavy weapons. And there was a Kurdish religious minority living in Sinjar, Shingal. And they were neither Muslims or Jews or Christians. They were, they were deemed to be um, devil worshippers. So the Islamic State made their best in, in killing, mass killing all of the, the men that they found. And the women, depending on age obviously, were famously enslaved to become sex slaves and sold on markets. And then to be gang raped until they die. Um, the youngest girls have been the most expensive, obviously. Under or below of 10, to early teens maybe. And women up to the 40s have been uh, it's as cheap as a pair of shoes sometimes, $10. The people who managed to escape from this, sexual slavery until death or being killed instantly, they all escaped up to this mountain called the Shingal Mountain. And they were trapped there until the Kurdish guerrilla of the YPG were able to cross the border from Syria into Iraq and fight the Islamic State and reach the mountain and organize a convoy of vehicles, even Volvo trucks, uh, who were able to rescue 40,000-ish individuals from the top of the mountain into Syria. And when they came over the border to a, to a collection place there, um, Thousands and thousands of people just keep, kept pouring out of these vehicles into the sand, screaming desperately for water because they were dying of thirst. Obviously, a lot of people already had died of thirst because this is early August and it's extremely hot in Iraq in August. And standing here, managing to take a few photos until I, I stopped doing that as well, was the most uh, painful thing I've ever experienced, ever feeling really, really helpless to do anything. I had three bottles of water, and there were thousands of people dying of thirst. Really, really, really difficult. Uh, this story of the attack against Shingal has been, um, since this point, world famous, all over international world media. The case of the sexual slavery of the Ezidi women, the minority, the Ezidi, has been a constant topic and theme in world media. How, how they are being, how they were treated, if they are perhaps rescued, what they are saying afterwards, how they are treated afterwards, maybe. Uh, it's been a symbol, not least in Western media, of the barbarity of the Islamic State. And last Friday, when the city was actually liberated again, uh, by various Kurdish forces with American air support, 
there was a lot of cover on it in the world media. Just a few hours later, Paris, of course, happened. And we all looked in that direction instead. When I was standing uh, on the border between Syria and Iraq, I was, as far as I could see, the only foreign journalist from the entire world standing on this border to report about this. There was no one else, because the border was closed from Iraq going in. I was there with my Danish photographer. And I reported to, um, to Swedish and international media, but I realized that I was actually being censored, what I said. Because what I reported that the Kurdish forces came in from Syria to Iraq to save these people. That was somehow blurred out of the picture. It was just Kurdish forces or even Obama and his bombings that had started just a few days earlier that miraculously somehow made these people go from that point to that point. Uh, this picture that I also took showed how the Kurdish women saved the Ezidi women from this sexual slavery across the border. And these uniform-clad women are extremely normal today, of course, to see in the media, because they are today our allies on the ground in Syria, our, our most important ally in the fight against the Islamic State. These women and men, obviously, of the Kurdish forces. This picture was um, published in Swedish public service. And it was online for two hours, and then deleted, for reasons I still don't know. Some people have claimed that uh, perhaps this was too um, un uh, sensitive somehow to publish this, this photo of some uh, military faction we didn't know so much about. I would rather say that it's actually the case that this was simply unknown who these people were, that they were militant Kurds in Syria playing some sort of role, and that they could actually do something like this. So this picture and my quotes were censored. And this is when I was the only foreign journalist there to witness this. Uh, this was, as we all know, one and a half months before the attack on the famous city Kobani happened in late September. When, of course, the world media were able to stand on this big hill, still known today as Press Hill by the locals, because only journalists could stand there. No locals or refugees or relatives uh, to document live the battle of the city between the Kurdish forces and Islamic State. And that brought a lot of media attention and made them our allies against the Islamic State. This ha had happened at this point. The Kurds were um, unknown at this point and hence unable to be a central theme in at least the Swedish context and Scandinavian context, a theme of, of reporting, because they were invisible for us before. The same with these people, world famous today, top news. It's extremely easy for me these days to work and sell stories and, and such about Syria, because I've been there, when it has to, uh, has to do with these guys. But why is it that these people were unknown to I imagine most of you and most other people in the West before June 2014, despite the fact that they existed and expanded before June 2014. Why? This made me crash into a wall, uh, so to say, and showed me the really brutal reality of the thin media reporting of the in of the kind of media reporting I wanted to do, where um, a lack of information from traditional media sources has actually made perspectives, whole perspectives, simply go away, vanish, or never appear at all. These kind of organizations were invisible, and the people fighting them were also in it, in invisible, invisible, before we had a reason to discover them. I was also shocked by the fact that structures in the media organizations make actually people like us who, who go to these places to document these things, who actually have an urge to find information not being published that often. 
we have to face these structures and systems which makes us un uh, we can't actually publish the things we find which is obviously a big problem when it comes to understanding a different region that is connected to us my goal when i became a journalist was to sort of mass educate instead of simply educate as a teacher through the mass communication system was I able to reach this goal no i've failed i've come to realize because of these structures that makes it really difficult to even if you have an urge to go to places few people go to and you have this we western connection because you are a westerner which makes it much more interesting for, sw for sweden to report about you still are going to have a situation where a lot of the information is going to be not published at all. And I come to ask myself the question, how many people do we actually reach in society? Uh, this thing, the IT revolution, as it's called, internet and such, has made us, has given us more, more tools than in the human history to actually educate ourselves and share information. Incredible, incredible possibilities for information, knowledge, sharing, etc., etc. But there's also a lot of limits to this, I've come to realize. Because these techniques come with limits, because there's certain algorithms. If you search a few things on YouTube and Google, there's going to be algorithms that makes you find similar things in the future not complete new information. Depending on what kind of friends you have on Facebook, you're going to have certain information, not all information. You all know this, of course. There is a collective delusion somehow that we are receiving more thoughts and information now than ever before, when it's not actually true. And this is a really, really harsh reality for a journalist to admit that you think that you are so incredibly important, what you write and what you think and what you do. And the harsh reality is that there's a lot of people who don't actually read or follow your news at all. At all. And sometimes it makes no difference. A lot of people don't actually follow or take part of new information, including editors, I would say. Uh, I would say many people today use these tools instead to create their own universes where they somehow create a world that can actually uh, confirm the truth that they already think of confirm thoughts they already have not all people but a lot of people normal people they reject all other information coming from the politically correct media or the communist conspiration of the public service and they take all the information they need and want from these other universes. The traditional media channels are abandoned and there's alternative ones created instead of these traditional ones. The very bad thing about this in the case of Sweden, the Swedish context, is that the majority of these new media channels are not progressive democratic ones, but far right and racist ones and very nationalist ones. The danger with this is that you have misinformation, you have hatred, you have dangerous consequences. When we have asylum center after asylum center burning because of the influx of Syrian refugees to Sweden. When we have a hand grenade thrown against asylum center in the city of Kalmar in Sweden. When we yesterday heard of uh, an attempted knife attack outside Vanesborg in Sweden. When this guy, just a few weeks ago, uh, attacked a school in the uh, Swedish city of Trollhättan, and with a sword, you see in this picture, he stabbed or sliced, I, I don't actually know, a teacher's assistant and a student to death. Both of them with uh, cultural roots in the Middle East and Somalia because of their skin color and their cultural background. Before this, he actually hugged a few Swedish girls, blonde Swedish girls. 
because he was angry with the influx of refugees from Syria. So I think uh, because of this, the circle is complete in my case. This happened in school, and I started this, this attempted change in school. What I came to realize after this is that we have a really dark future ahead of us because of the, of the current crisis in the world, not the least the ref refugee crisis. The central question is how do we get better communication in our so-called mass communication society? where obviously not all people are mass communicating. Uh, my answer is to find a new, simply to find a combination of these two, former and, and current combina uh, knowledge that I have, by, uh, by combining them and finding a new U-turn in my life, in my profession, by um, both continuing going to, to war areas and reporting, but also doing my utmost to, since coming back home from Syria at the turn of August, I've been done my best to accept all invitations to lecture in public uh, secondary schools and other public events about the reasons behind the refugee crisis, first and utmost, to try to reach the people with personal communication again, because the mass communication has not worked to reach all people. And I came home 5.30 to Uppsala this morning because I just finished a week-long tour in the north of Sweden. Um, last night, on a Friday night, I was speaking in the small Swedish town of Sollefteå, which mo most people haven't even been to. On a Friday night, 45 people came to listen to me speak about mass killing, death, war, the Islamic State, and resistance. Choosing away alcohol and the traditional Swedish taco dinner on a Friday. And that actually filled my heart with a lot of hope. And I think that what we need now is hope and a lot more better communication. Thank you.